So welcome everybody to the last quantum seminar of this semester. We are very happy to have Professor Stefan Philipp here from uh, the um, TU Munich, uh, where he is also the director of the Walter Meissner Institute. Um, just recently, actually, since to May 2020. Before that, he was uh, he worked with IBM um, uh, as a researcher and be for actually quite some time um, uh, since 2014. And uh, before that, he uh, did a postdoc at the ETH Zurich from 2008 to 2014 and received his PhD from the University of Vienna in 2006. And then here's something peculiar. He uh, made a bachelor after he made a master of science, uh, at least according to this uh, article here. So he received a bachelor in physics in 2003 from Vienna and a master of science in physics from the University of Uppsala in 2002. So uh, what happened there? Uh, and Well, you can answer that when you, uh, later. So uh, we are super happy to have you and looking very much forward to your talk. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the opportunity at, in the last seminar to discuss a bit our work, what we have been doing. Um, as for the bachelor and masters, it was actually, I did a masters, uh, I did two masters, one in the TU Munich and one in, during my Erasmus uh, stay. So that basically explains that why there is another master over there. And that was actually recommendable to everybody spending some time in, in Sweden it was quite nice. There it actually, it started a bit in, I, started in theory and then went on to experiment and now uh, discussing experiment with superconducting qubits. And that's what I want to share with you. So you should see on my screen, we tried before. So in principle that should work. So what I want to discuss is how to control superconducting quantum circuits and do something uh, that will become useful at some point. So for quantum information processing, quantum computing, and uh, what I want to describe a bit in more detail, coming from a very global perspective and then entering also a bit technical details about what we are looking into currently uh, for the perspective of uh, uh, doing quantum computation for quantum chemistry. So what you see in the beginning here, that's uh, artistic impression of a hydrogen molecule. You see these bonding orbitals here. And so what we have done is we simulated a hydrogen molecule and use some approach so that we can actually do this more efficient than just doing uh, a standard approach. So a bit of the introduction uh, so that we uh, warm up with the problem of quantum computing. I just want to remind everybody what it is about. And because I find it uh, really interesting that we can now have a means for solving actual problems that are too complex for classic computing systems. And I think that means actually a lot because we can actually open up more possibilities and do something that we couldn't do otherwise. So that's, I think, a good uh, objective actually to start in exploring this field. And you all know what we can do or what, we, what there is promise that we can do. These algebraic algorithms like factoring, optimization problems, traveling salesmen, but uh, people are more and more interested in kind of business processes, risk analysis, financial processes, because there's lots of money involved. So there is a clear motivation in studying these type of problems. But what I find is probably the most interesting, both as a physicist, but also when it comes to how, how useful or how, uh, how much promise there can be in, in, in coming to a solution is the simulation of quantum mechanics itself. So there's chemistry problems, material problems. So and using like quantum system for studying quantum mechanics itself. And that's where quantum chemistry belongs to. So I'm also, because I was at the company at IBM, I also find it interesting to ask the question, why this quantum computing is interesting right now? And there is, first there is technology that has evolved and we are, have the means now in looking into these problems, both from the theory, but also from the, the quantum experimental side of view. But one also has to see that there is this computing power of performance graphs, this Moore's law that everybody knows. And if you look at those, then they were ever increasing performance in here, for example, the number of transistors over time. But you also see that some of these performance indices like the single thread performance or the frequency, they just flatten out. And what does this mean? This means actually that it becomes harder and harder to making more and more and better and better processors. It's you have to invest more and more money 
and it's not clear whether you get a return on your investment soon. And also the physics is against you because it gets harder in scaling transistors down to the two nanometer feature sizes. So that's why quantum computing became quite interesting also in the recent years from a commercial perspective. But also here as a reminder, it's not the only thing that people think of is the next paradigm. There is constant evolution and uh, next generation systems where the performance of chips itself in 3D integration technology and all that is basically um, uh, investigated. So that's also one of the uh, directions, but also neuromorphic computing, like having in hardware, the synaptic, these neural networks, that's a current trend that people are trying to get more out of a computer processor. But quantum uh, computing is one of these things. And that's why people are quite interesting at the moment. What can be done? Uh, what can we do with that? I want to talk a bit about quantum chemistry. And so what is it about? So it is about electrons. It's about electrons having kinetic energy, having a potential energy when surrounding the nuclei and having some uh, co um, um, ha having uh, correlations between those, which is uh, expressed by this term. So with this Hamiltonian, which you can simply write down for any number of electrons, it's actually hard to simulate this. It's one of the most challenging problems actually, because there's fermions and these fermions are typically hard to simulate. So the question is, can we do something to compute, for example, the molecular structure, the ground states of these Hamiltonians, but also, for example, reaction rates. So instead of pouring now uh, substances together at a certain temperature, waiting for a certain time and see what comes out, we want to actually get a handle on to compute this, to compute this up front, what would be uh, a typical reaction of, of two molecular compounds. Unfortunately, that's, that's hard. And why is it hard? And I think that's also an interesting approach to why is a quantum computer better than a classic computer? Because we have to see now that to describe these electronic wave functions, we need to actually create a wave function which is exponentially large. And so the simple example for this hydrogen molecule, we would not consider electrons in different binding orbitals. So in this 1s plus 1s gives us the sigma binding orbital or this antibonding sigma orbital and this pi orbitals and so on and so forth with increasing energy. So we have now to distribute the different electrons in a molecule over all these orbitals. That's basically our basis states. And these basis states and how many electrons do we distribute over the basis states? That's a combinatorial problem. We just see that we have this binomial coefficient in how can we distribute n electrons over m orbitals. And all these different possibilities go then into the wave function that describes this molecule. And now we can just count and see that uh, this function actually grows quite rapidly. So for a simple putatien molecule, which has 22 electrons, Typically, one considers then 82 uh, orbitals, so that's uh, this rough number. We have already two to the 65 possibilities. And that's an enormous amount of possibilities and ground states. So we have to actually store this ground state, this wave function of these electrons somewhere and compute and do some computation with that. And that's not simple on a classical computer. Sorry for that. because we can simply now count what is the um, what is the memory needed to store a quantum state so that holds for any quantum state but we are looking now into orbitals or number of electrons so for a simple qubit or one orbital we would have a quantum uh, for one qubit um, we would have a quantum state which is the superposition state which has these two coefficients and then we can go on for two qubits we all know there is then four coefficients, so we have two to the two. And this exponential scaling then tells us that at some point reaching this boundary here between 30 and 60, so typically at 50, 55 or so, we need an enormous amount of storage space to actually store the wave function of these electrons. And that's this magic boundary is somewhere around 50, 55 or so, 
where one says it becomes kind of impossible to compute uh, such a system on a classical computer because just of the number of bytes needed exceeds what is available nowadays. Going a bit further means that we just don't have the means at all. We would need the number of atoms in the universe. So and that I find is a kind of uh, uh, in, uh, illustrative approach to why a quantum computer where we can store these quantum states directly in has or has the promise to have an advantage over classic computation. What does this mean in, when you want to represent now molecules by qubits? So using a specific uh, basis function, we can then reduce water to 14 qubits. So that would be sufficient actually to get uh, the ground state of water calculated on a quantum computer. Whereas we would need 10 to the four classical bits. So that's still doable, not a big problem, but it gets more and more a problem, the more complicated the molecules get. And here we have for penicillin, finding ground states, finding configurations of penicillin would take 10 to the 86. Uh, that's a very large number or equivalently about 280 qubits. So that means, sure, let's build a quantum computer, let's build qubits and just simulate or look at the um, uh, run a quantum algorithm, which tells us about the, the energy configuration, the ground states and compute useful properties. The point is, even if we would have this 280 qubits, at the moment, it seems that they are not perfect. And I will come back to this later that we have to take this into account that we don't have these perfect qubits available. So, and we have to find some ways to still do something useful with a quantum computer. Another word of caution I, I want to bring in here because it's also that uh, physicists or chemists, uh, they are clever and they are smart. And why, whereas you could now just go ahead and do a straightforward calculation of the wave function or the Hamiltonian of the ground states and diagonalize the problem, then it would be an exponentially large problem. But you can also do exponential uh, approximations. And there is different methods to come up with different approximations that still give valuable results. There is quite brute force uh, approximations, these Hartree-Fock mean field theories. Here, you need only computing power which grows to the uh, cube n cubed, so n is again the system size. So that's rather modest scaling with the system size, but it also gives, it doesn't give you uh, very good uh, results. If you go on and get better approximations and more complicated methods, then the scaling grows. Here it's n to the seven for these coupled cluster methods, and you increase the accuracy. But then again, the system size shrinks. So there is this trade-off there is a complexity of the problem related uh, to the accuracy that is needed. And still one has to keep in mind that there is algorithms that do quite good already right now and beating them with a quantum computer is also not a, a straightforward task. So let me come then what can we do now? What are we doing? What is the different ways to do quantum computing? You all know that there is different qubit realizations I'm having here some examples of what is currently uh, on the market. We need a two level system and these comes in different disguises. Uh, we have just discussed previously, there is ion traps. They are quite promising here on linear scale ion traps where they are aligned in linear arrays. You use lasers, you can also use microwaves, shine them on them, um, um, prepare certain internal electronic states of the ions and via vibrational modes, you can couple these. And that's a very promising approach. And there is now tens of ions now uh, in this linear traps and computers are built on these. There is neutral atoms. You can capture them uh, using lasers, using uh, traps. You can put them in Rydberg states. And then it becomes interesting because there is a large collective interaction between different atoms. That's currently a quite promising approach. There is gates shown. It's um, not yet on the scalable uh, way to a quantum computer, but I would say that so one has to 
it will become quite promising. And there is also solid state systems like quantum dots. Here you have electrons and electron spins confined in a solid state matrix. Here you have electrodes. And here between these electrons, you can store no electrons and manipulate their spin or their, their emotional degree of freedom. And we, we are also using a solid state approach. We are using superconducting circuits. And with these superconducting circuits, I will come back in a minute uh, what, what these really are. We can now form chips, uh, put several of these qubits that you see here together using resonators to link these qubits and read them out. And that's also quite promising. And with these, we have at the moment a controllable quantum processors already available. So roughly what is uh, available is about 50 qubits. There is, and that's also interesting in the recent years, uh, this has uh, been turned into a commercial effort. So Google with Google AI or IBM Quantum Experience as the front runners in superconducting qubits and companies like AQT and, and IonQ as um, uh, companies involved with ion trap quantum computers. There is also in development, I apologize for not naming now the, the ion trap developments uh, that are also around here, but focusing more on the superconducting ones. So there is open SuperQ. There is a GECOS project that we are uh, having here in Germany for building a scalable quantum computer. And there will be more coming up uh, soon in Germany and, uh, and also in, in Europe for superconducting qubits, trapped ions, but also others. Uh, like other technologies, like these atoms, like spins, or like photons. We see that there is first signatures of this quantum advantage. So running certain type of random algorithms, we can already see that there is um, an advantage of a quantum computer. There is, we see as well in these experiments, that there is many challenges ahead. We need to scale up the devices. 50 or 100 qubit is actually not enough. Uh, also the fidelities are not enough at the moment. So we need to improve on the coherence, but also in the controls and to reach eventually these next milestones, which in my view is we need to come up with a practical quantum algorithm. So really showing that a quantum computer can behave more performant than a classic computer, but also these error corrected qubits. So let me focus and tell you a little bit about what a superconducting qubit processor is about. So what we need for a superconducting qubit processor, we need this device that you see here on the right. This is a dilution refrigerator. We need to cool it. And what we are cooling is chips, which basically consist of two rather simple elements, qubits as nonlinear elements and resonating structure as harmonic oscillator, as linear elements that link between these qubits. And how these operate is actually quite simple on a conceptual level, because just can think of how to build now out of electronic circuits, quantum electronic circuits. For an electronic circuits, we have a circuit, we have this capacitance and we have inductances. We also would have resistors, but resistors we don't want to have because they cause noise. So, and as the simplest element that we can think of is this harmonic LC oscillator, an inductance storing magnetic field energy and a capacitance storing electrostatic energy. So in classical terms, that's these two terms in the Hamiltonian and also the sizes that we are using and the uh, geometries give typically rise to the six gigahertz-ish around frequencies. That is quite convenient because there's lots of equipment around to control actually these electronic circuits. In a quantum fashion, this means we are just putting now hats on the operator. So we have this H bar omega A dagger A Hamiltonian, and we have harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian in the different states here um, that we can use as the bosonic modes. And how this comes in our system is these photons, these harmonic oscillator photons, excitations they live in this coplanar waveguide resonators. And what you see here is a coplanar waveguide, meaning a coax cable that is basically cut in a 2D, in a 2D plane. And there is some intersections here so that the electromagnetic field then 
uh, lives is confined between these two uh, intersections and forms a standing wave. And that's the excitations of the, of the resonating structures, the photons that we are using. To make a qubit out of that, because for these harmonic structures, we cannot make a qubit. The qubit, we need to select somehow the lowest levels of these. We put an element in there, which is a Josephson junction. A Josephson junction is two superconducting electrodes. We have then Cooper pairs tunneling from one to the other via this tunnel oxide layer. And this can be seen as a non-linearity non in this unharmonic oscillator. This changes the Hamiltonian. We get this cosine term and expanding this cosine term into the A dagger A into a creation and annihilation operator, we get this nonlinear term in there. And with this nonlinear term, we are getting instead of the harmonic potential, we are getting an unharmonic potential. And that means now we can select these lowest two energy levels and use them as a qubit. We'll see later on that actually there is the upper levels can be useful or annoying, depending on the perspective that we have. We have to take it into account, but it gives us the mean actually it means to operate this qubit with the two lowest lying energy levels. Here is an actual micrograph of the qubit. Uh, sorry, I forgot, uh, I have to add the, the scale bars. So the scale is typically about 500 micrometer in size. So it's a rather macroscopic object. And the more nano, nano size object in between here is this Josephson junction that comes as the tunneling uh, between, so, the, the, so that Cooper pairs can tunnel from this electrode to the other electrode. And that you see here, and the typical size of that is uh, if, uh, na uh, about 100 nanometer times 100 nanometer area that we have here. And that's this tunneling Josephson junction. We can also uh, tune, we can um, do some modification on the geometry. We add this grid loop. This grid loop means now that this energy term here, this flux energy depends now on a magnetic field on an externally applied magnetic field. And with this, we can change, for example, the frequency of the qubit or of coupling elements. I will use this then later on. So to summarize, we have this qubit. In our system, we have them at fixed frequency. So they come at a certain frequency, typically around five gigahertz. They live for so the T1 times T2 times are about 100, 150 microseconds. And we can do gates, we can do single qubit operations. I will come back to that later on in about 10 nanoseconds and two qubit operations in about 100 to 200 nanoseconds. Then we have these microwave resonators. They are used for actually reading out the qubit states. They are used for linking the qubits and also as noise filters. And we can also have some tunable uh, resonators in between or coupling element that is useful actually for coupling these qubits and um, doing some operation on two qubit set setups. So how does the setup look like? So we have now this chip that's actually mounted on the lowest stage of a dilution refrigerator. We cool it down to 15 millikelvin. We have these different stages here of, the, uh, of this cryostat. You see the microwave cabling going in. You see these uh, shiny elements here in terms of circulators, isolators, copper rods, and filters. And on the external side, we have this microwave control electronics to operate the qubit. A short movie from my old lab at IBM. How this then looks like in uh, in full glory. So we see now that dismantling this cryostat is basically like a, a this uh, unwrapping a, a thermos can. We have these different layers, and at the bottom here we mount the qubit, and we have all these shields now at the different temperature stages that protect the qubit from the environment. And we only use this microwave cables going in as a controlled interaction with the environment. Oops, no. So I've mentioned it's quite, so I, I would say the, um, the, uh, 
progress that is made in the recent years is probably the, the most well-known result is this quantum supremacy experiment where Google did a random circuit and compared it actually how long would it take to get to the same output statistics of 53 qubits uh, using classic computation. And they basically um, showed that it would take their estimate is 10,000 years or so to come up with the same statistics. Then IBM uh, made another algorithm, said that it took only two days. But anyhow, it tells us that with this quantum computer, we can get to some uh, outputs, some results that is hard to simulate uh, with a classic computer. And this output can be done in a controlled fashion. The other side of the story, is this IBM quantum experience. So there the focus is that everybody, you can play around. We get now uh, the access to these quantum computers with uh, being able to control the qubits. And there is a whole fleet of different quantum computers that is accessible. For example, going here from uh, 20 cells, from five qubits to 65 qubits and if you look a little bit closer, we also see that uh, we all get the numbers uh, that is associated to this. We get the layouts here. And we also see that there is errors in the qubits. And that's now essential because we have to find a way actually to deal with these errors, with the single qubit errors, also with these two qubit controlled errors. And that's why we have to find a way to go from this vision of a universal quantum computing stack that basically involves that we have physical qubits that we lump together to form a logical qubit in here and do the nice algorithms on top of this logical qubit layer. We have to find a way actually whether we can do some algorithms that are useful already at this level of physical qubits and come up with short quantum algorithms, use the hardware as efficiently as possible and do something useful before we get to this error of uh, this um, error corrected quantum computer. How can we measure them? And I'm bringing this graph now because it's then I, I want to dig into two of these aspects how we can increase the quantum volume. And the quantum volume is basically a measure how good a quantum computer is, or is one of the measures. I don't want to debate uh, whether it's um, uh, the best measure or not, but just want to tell that it's one measure that tells us how many qubits we have, this number of n, and how long can an algorithm be before decoherence sets in. So that's this d, this error rate. And there is a minimum in telling us if we have a quantum computer which has a single qubit, which is perfect, so where this d is large, um, that the depth of this algorithm is large, but it's only a single qubit, that's of no use. And on the other side, if we have many qubits, so a large n, but only a short depth, so we cannot do something with them, that's also of no use. So that's why this minimum is around. We have to look into the number of qubits, but also how far can we go in the number of steps. And there's the okay, current values of this is six to seven, telling you that you can effectively use on these IBM machines, for example, six to seven qubits and go along six to seven steps uh, in this horizontal direction for an algorithm. What is the parameters? And so what is there to improve this? So first it's the number of qubits, but it's also the number of successful gates, meaning we can improve on the error per gate, but also the execution speed, how fast can it be? The connectivity, how much, uh, how good we can interact, uh, let all qubits interact with, with each other. What is the gate set that's available? So basically if we have an algorithm, how efficient can we implement this directly on hardware? And also the number of parallel operations. And so we did a few experiments or investigations along these two lines. So along the line of implementing, uh, decreasing the error per gate and increasing the execution speed, but also in forming, uh, exploring what different gate sets one can use to make algorithms more efficient. So that's where I'm coming now back to this quantum chemistry problem. 
when we want to determine the ground state energy of a molecular Hamiltonian, for example, the hydrogen uh, Hamiltonian, we need a certain algorithm. And one algorithm, which is quite interesting and is now used heavily in many experiments, is known as this variational quantum, um, variational algorithm, which is a variational method that can be used in principle for any Hamiltonian. And here I'm using it on the example of quantum chemistry. So what does it? The task is, we want to figure out what is the ground state of a given Hamiltonian. So what do we do to find this ground state? We have to calculate its energy. And if this energy is minimal, then we know first the minimum energy and also the ground state uh, it, itself. So we have to minimize the energy function, this E, as the expectation value of this given Hamiltonian. So we have to take first the Hamiltonian. I mentioned before this electron configuration Hamiltonian. Since we don't have electrons, but we have qubits, we have to find a way to map this Hamiltonian to, to qubits. And there is a straightforward way how to do this. And at least for simple molecules, that's uh, quite a simple task to do. And we can end up with a hydrogen molecular Hamiltonian here in terms of two qubits, for example, where we know exactly what is this qubit uh, terms. And that's the Hamiltonian that we need, uh, that where we want to find the minimum energy of. How is this done? So what we are doing here, because I told you before that storing this wave function on a classic computer is hard. So we're using now this quantum processor and use this for storing the quantum state. So we're preparing the quantum state on this uh, quantum processor. We prepare so-called trial states. And this theta is now some parameters that we are tuning. So that's single qubit gates, two qubit gates. And then we measure the qubits. We measure the expectation values of these operators and evaluate this energy function. The classical optimizer to choose these new thetas um, we choose them or we optimize now the thetas, these parameters, until we find the minimum energy function. So that's this hybrid quantum classic computer where we use the classic computer to optimize over a certain parameter space to prepare the right ground state on the quantum computer until we find the solution. So this we can do in a straightforward way. And that was these first experiments done at IBM where we just go ahead, take the number of qubit that is needed, act with them, uh, act on them with specific single qubit gates, use this entangling operation, act again with single qubit states and do this over and over for a certain uh, depth. The target state that we are creating is then these operations acting on the initial state and we optimize over these parameters theta, the single qubit. Uh, parameters. Then we measure the energy, the cost function, for example, for this hydrogen molecule. But we also note that whatever we are doing here, this target state is not very specific to a chemistry problem or to any problem at all. It's we are navigating basically in Hilbert space, hoping that we are getting close to this, uh, to the actual ground state or to the actual state that minimizes this cost function. Still, using specific techniques, uh, which I don't want to explain in detail, like this error mitigation techniques, we can get quite close to the actual curve, to this um, binding energy curve. So that's basically binding energy as a function of the interatomic distance of this hydrogen molecule. So for each of these points, one minimizes the, um, the cost function and finds this ground state and finds good qualitative, but also quantitative agreement if we are doing uh, certain error mitigation uh, strategies. For larger molecules, we also see that it works qualitatively quite, uh, quite well. And it's also for larger chains, we get uh, qualitative and for smaller chains, uh, uh, we get good agreement with this curve. Still, we need to find actually, we can actually do a bit better than that in just thinking what is the problem actually, and how do we navigate in Hilbert space? 
So let's go back to the problem itself and see what is actually the wave function. What is this wave function that I want to prepare on my quantum computer? So we had this example of hydrogen with the protons and then an electron can be in this symmetric state, in this gerade state with a spin up. So where the electron um, distribution function is positive around the left and the positive around the right um, proton, it can have spin down with the same spatial distribution function, but it can also be in this uh, anti-symmetric state where we have the amplitude of the electron density being negative around the second nu uh, nuclei. So we have this ungerade wave function with spin up and spin down. And that's the most basic ba ba set of basis function that we can use. And now we can distribute now the electrons over these basis functions. And now we realize that first with this basis function, there can be now zero, one, two, three, or four electrons in these, but we select now a subspace where we know exactly the number of electrons. So we know that there is n, there is two electrons. So we'll use only states where there is two occupations, two excitations in the system. And that spans the ground state. So the ground state is now a superposition of these basis states. And then we realize that acting with uh, gates that only exchange these ones between the different basis states, so gates that preserve the number of excitations in the system, then we don't leave the Hilbert space. So we then search among the possible grounds, uh, among the possible states, we, serve, uh, we search for our ground state. In, we can also further reduce uh, if we don't take into account now the magnetic momentum. So we don't take into account the spins and reduce the problem further to just having a ground state, which is the zero one or one zero excitation. So we reduce it to two qubits. And what does this bring us? This brings us an advantage because we can just go, we can navigate around this restricted Hilbert space and be more efficient in the number of gates. So that's what we, are, uh, what we have calculated here. For example, calculating now the ground state of hydrogen molecule or lithium hydrogen or beryllium dihydride or H2O using this form that I described before using C knot entanglers would take a certain number of gates so that we reach chemical accuracy. And that's plotted here. It's a growing number of gates shown in this axis on the circuit depth. And um, drawing now the T1 limit, one see that uh, we go beyond the limit on T1, here we assume some hundred of microseconds for the T1, we immediately go beyond this T1 limit. So meaning that the quantum algorithm won't give a reasonable result. We could now implement this exchange type gates and decompose it into C0 gates. And that would give us an overhead of a factor of nine. With this, we could come into the reach of what is possible, even for larger molecules. But we can also reduce this and directly implement these exchange type gates, these I-swap gates. And if you are using that, then we can see that our circuit is short enough so that within this coherence time, we could calculate uh, also larger molecules. We focused on this H2. We had a two qubit uh, setup. In this two qubit setup, we've uh, implemented um, a so-called tunable coupling element. Here's qubit one, qubit two, we have this tunable coupler. And with this tunable coupler, we can now do exchange operations between qubit one and qubit two by modulating the frequency of this tunable coupler. That means I'm actually modulating this interaction between those, uh, between the two qubits and I can turn on and off this qubit, qubit coupling. And what does this do? It basically swaps between the one zero and zero one state. If the modulation frequency of this coupler, so it's a parametric modulation, equals this difference in the qubit frequencies. So without going into details, what we are getting is this uh, minus plus, plus minus uh, Hamiltonian terms, this I swap gate. 
And with this, we can then go ahead and do this variational algorithm as discussed before to calculate the ground state, but also higher energy states of the hydrogen molecule. So what we're doing, we're putting in here one excitation in the system by this X gate. We're doing this exchange type interaction and then vary the theta and the phi, so the phase of this interaction and also the amount of this swapping between and compute now the ground state using this variational approach. The result was that we are getting, uh, again, we were getting this um, bond length, um, this binding energy curve as a function of the bond length. And we can calculate how far we are away from this chemical accuracy. And we see that we are pretty close. We were actually limited by the coupler, by the coherence of the coupler in these experiments, but pr pretty close to chemical accuracy without any further error mitigation. We also investigated the methods so that we cannot only uh, compute the ground state, but we can also compute the excited states. And that's by a version of this where we measure a few more poly operators and then via some mathematical construction, we can compute also higher excited state of molecules and also extract how close they're in energy to the, to the exact energy, uh, to the exact calculated energy. So meaning having a hardware that supports a better gate set helps, but one can also work now on the qubits themselves and how fast such algorithms can be performed. And that's a, a different direction that we are, have pursued and we're still pursuing. And that goes in the direction in how good can we control the qubits. And so let's go back to a single qubit. You all know that uh, this block sphere description is we can bring the qubit into an excited state. In our case, is uh, this by shining in a microwave signal. So we have here a capacitive coupling to the qubit and by shining in a microwave pulse, we can now um, we can do single qubit gates by changing the amplitude and by changing the phase of this. We implement an X pulses or Y pulses on the qubits. I also told you that our qubit is not actually the perfect qubit because we have zero and one states, but we also have higher excited states. And unfortunately, they are not very well separated in frequency. So if this is five point, about five gigahertz, then this delta is about 300 megahertz. So we have 4.7 gigahertz. So close in frequency, we have this other level. So without knowing what to do and just shining in a microwave pulse, we will always excite also this upper state here and leak out of the computational subspace. And this needs to be avoided. And this can be avoided actually by shaping and uh, calibrating the pulse well enough so that we are just addressing these two levels. There is analytical methods for doing so, but at some point these analytical methods fail. So what we investigated is, can we now decompose the pulse here into different discrete time steps? And for each of these time steps, we can now shift the amplitude and control the amplitude, optimize what is the correct, the proper pulse shape that exactly does a pi pulse without any leakage or a pi half pulse without any leakage to these upper, upper states. So that's this A, N and B ends, these piecewise constant pulse amplitudes that we are optimizing. The optimization itself is then a bit more tedious because it involves that we measure something on the pulse itself. Our qubits are not God given. So the structure is basically determined in fabrication. We know quite well actually how they will come out, but there is a certain uncertainty in what is the actual frequency. There is also couplings to spurious modes. So we have to actually find uh, this measurement. We have to find the optimal pulse by measuring the system. So what we are doing to measure to find out what is the optimal pulse is we are doing this randomized benchmarking sequences. So here you see this uh, population as a function of number of clipboards. This is basically, we are doing a set of gates and at the end we return, we invert all what, was all what has happened before. And so ideally we get a ground state population of one. If there's errors, then we see this exponential decay function. And now we can see if the gate is worse, 
and then this will decay faster. And if it's good, then it will decay slower. So we can take this as the cost function of, so for a certain number of Cliffords, we take this as a cost function for optimizing now uh, the, the pulses. So that's what we did. We started off with a simple pulse. The initial was an analytical function, this drag pulse. The cost function we started here with 0 0.5 and doing several iterations of an optimization algorithm, CMAS, we, we use in this case, we ended up with a pulse that looks like that. And this pulse has actually better fidelity for shorter pulse length. So we can see this effect that if you follow this line here and do just a simple uh, analytical pulse and go now from uh, slower pulses to faster pulses, at some point we see that the gate fidelity drops because we're getting leakage because it cannot cope with the second level and the excitation with higher states. Instead, if you're doing this optimization, we follow now this blue line, and then we get a straight line in the gate fidelity telling us that we are avoiding, and we have also quantified this, that we are following, that we are not leaking out of the computational subspace even for these shorter pulses as short as a few nanoseconds. And here we then hit the limit in terms of amplitude we can send down to the experiment, but one could uh, even think of how far this could go down. As the last point, last uh, three minutes or so, the question is then now how fast can we be in this optimization? We need many pulses. And with as many pulses, we need to be fast in actually doing the um, doing this calibration. And there is one problem. The one problem that we have is if the qubits live long enough, between experiments, we have to wait until the qubits decay. So if we have one experiment, we measure, then we have a T1 decay, we have to wait until the qubit relaxes to the ground state until we can do the, sec the next experiment and so on. And that limits actually how fast we can do our experiments. There are several ways out of that. We can actually go ahead and reset the qubit independent, so dependent on the state it has. If it was in the one state, we can reset the qubits. We can do this actively or, and that's one, so we tried also this active reset. But what I want to present here is we are doing this restless measurements. And restless means now we don't wait for this uh, T1 decay to happen, but just take the knowledge that we have measured the state before and know that it is a zero in the one state and analyze and post-process the data, taking this measurement outcome into account. And just quickly to show what has happened in a simple example, we are doing now an experiment where we do some sequence here, this G, we measure, then we repeat, and first we wait now here, and then we look at the different signals. So that's in the IQ plane, so that's the measurement signal, but don't worry about what it is. We just know that if it's in this quadrant, then it should be a zero state. And if it's this quadrant, then it should be a one state. So when doing this experiments, when doing nothing to the qubit, we'll find it in the zero state. If we repeat it in the next repetition, if we don't do anything, we'll find it in the zero state again. In the next repetition again, so we have now n equal three. And if you now apply X pulses, for example, to calibrate what an X pulse would do, we would end up in this one state. And then we wait for a certain time. So an X pulse again brings us to this one state and another experiment will also find in this one state. Uh, another identity pulse brings us back or is, will result in a zero state. So that's the normal setup. The drawback, as said, we have to wait for the qubit to relax between the different experiments. So what happens now if we don't wait? If we don't wait and do the same thing, we find out that the first one the doing nothing brings us to the zero state. Then doing nothing again, we remain in the zero state. Doing nothing will remain in the zero state. But now if we do an X pulse, the first X pulse, we will measure at one state here. But then we don't wait until it decays. We do another X pulse, and this will bring us to the zero state back. And we don't wait, so it will bring us to the one state. So we get some scrambling of these data points. And 
the identity then brings us here. So what one can do, and there's, um, it is a simple procedure, is then just not take the signal in the one state, but just take, take the different signal, meaning we take the signal conditioned on the previous measurement outcome and take into account what was the starting state. And there's some subtleties with this. So we discriminate the data by qubit states of the previous measurements. There is some subtleties uh, with this because we have to take into account T1, DK, and measurement errors that are different than for the zero and the one state. But if we do this properly, and that was we have shown that this can be done for these calibration measurements, we can then get to two different data sets where in one we initialize, we know that the initialization was in zero, and in the other it was in one, and then analyze this separately and then combine this. And with these, we can do calibration measurements. We can do the experiments in a much faster way. This would be the trace where we don't do this discrimination. And we have shown now that there is basically no difference in doing some RADI experiments. There is also no difference in doing this randomized benchmarking. And the amount uh, of gain that we get is this 50 times uh, for this randomized benchmarking experiment or up to 250 times uh, for this RABI experiment. So we're doing this basically um, at 250 kilohertz versus one kilohertz of the normal measurement. With this, I want to finish. I want to thank all the people involved. So that's people that are now at WMI, but um, most of the work has been done still at IBM Research in Zurich uh, with these collaborators. And also I want to thank the collaborators for uh, in, at IBM in New York town and want to finish again with this uh, intriguing statement that there is this uh, visionary goal in building a quantum computer based on quantum physics that helps us to solve problems that are otherwise intractable. And so where are we at the moment? We know that we are somewhere in this small scale to medium scale um, setups where we can tame up to 50 to 100 qubits, that's uh, uh, still a stretch at the moment, but we're somewhere here in between. We want to go to this universal quantum computer and there's lots of challenges ahead, but I'm quite uh, motivated and also confident that uh, in the next years we'll get closer and closer to this universal quantum computer. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot for the talk. I'm, well, I'm sending the appropriate clap smileys and celebration smileys. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure there are a couple of questions. Um, I mean, just for, as a starter, what, what is currently the um, level of um, qubits in, in uh, uh, yeah, with those uh, microwave qubits? that are entangled i mean i think you you i mean how many do you have and how much what is the biggest amount that people have so so we are working on the level of one to five qubits i would say or so we are designing now five qubit setups um and uh, what yeah like google and ibm they have now 50 qubits and you see this all this uh, 65 qubits around so that's basically the maximum that you can do at the moment so that's kind of the standard so to say if you have uh, worked on this and i think in getting there um, is possible the interesting question is then how far this uh, can then go in the next years and what is the challenges ahead and i would say in getting them to the next 100 or 500 qubits that will become the um uh, an interesting challenge. Great. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, looking forward to it, I guess. Um, are there other questions? Very surprised that Dimitri Butka has no questions. Maybe he's mentally preparing for the uh, dissertation uh, d defense of Yinan. Uh, no, he doesn't have a question. He's just turned on his media to show that he's there. I asked another question because I didn't really understand it. Um, with your piecewise uh, constant pulses, I mean, there was, um, I mean, it's just like a, a really a numerical or like an optimization um, 
assuming that you have, uh, I mean, you apply some sort of Gaussian pulse and then you take uh, experimental imperfection into account and you uh, approximate this with piecewise constant uh, microwave amplitudes. I'm just, yeah, I'm, I i don't understand. First of all, um, uh, here you, you have this graph where you show it as a function of pulse length. Um, so you reduce the pulse length while keeping the uh, samples constant, or uh, you have the same amount of samples, uh, or the samples get shorter. So the, the, the samples, um, the samples are fixed. Uh, so the um, the sampling rate is fixed. So for the shorter pulses, you have less samples, and so that makes basically this optimization simpler. Um, so what you're doing then is you optimize over this set of parameters, uh, which I think for the lowest one, it was then uh, around, uh, I don't recall the exact number, 15 or, or 20 sample points or so for the I and Q values, up to this more 50 or 60 for the longer pulses. And the tedious part is then basically that you have to optimize over these variables you have to find a good initial guess. You have to find a good uh, way so that the optimization algorithm works. And you also have to take into account that um, your experimental feed, so you always have to have this closed loop feedback. So you need to measure the, the pulses and then um, optimize the parameters. And so getting this to work stably, that was basically the uh, main challenge here. And Finding and then at the end, if you have more complicated pulses, the problem is that your parameters grow too large. So, so you have to find basically a better approximation of your uh, pulses and find better basis functions. But I, I assume, like uh, for in a, in a perfect situation, you can give an analytical ideal uh, pulse shape. I would assume. Uh, yes and no. For for the ideal qubit which is this unharmonic oscillator, you could do this. But since there is other qubits around, there is uh, other microwave modes around, there's other couplings around, you're not fully certain whether your pulse shape will work. And it actually does not. So that's actually the uh, experimental finding that our qubits are not as perfect or the Hamiltonian description is not as, as good as we would hope so. So there's always some kind of we need to adapt for for the actual imperfections of the system. So that is basically why the pulse shape then looks like uh, edgy and uh, strange. It takes into account the uh, experimental uh, unknowns. Uh, yeah, exactly. Of your system. Also, for example, the microwave lines. You don't know perfectly the response function uh, yeah. of the lines. And so you don't know basically whether the pulse, the analytic pulse actually arrives at the qubit or how it is distorted when it arrives at the qubit. Thank you. Other questions? Ferdinand is silent. He probably acknowledges dominance of superconducting qubits over ion traps. Maybe he doesn't. Um, maybe uh, well, I can I can continue if if nobody uh, has other questions. Um, I'm wondering how to. I mean, you have this nonlinearity um, to basically push one of the modes away, and I'm just wondering whether it's possible uh, somehow uh, introducing more Josephson junctions or changing the Josephson junction to to change the curvature basically of this potential to push the mode, the annoying mode further away. Yes, so there is ways actually to making other types of qubits that's uh, um, investigated a lot actually. The appeal of the simple transmon type qubit is that you really have only one junction. And so that makes it fab wise, also coherence wise uh, easier. And also to um, stick more of them together is, is quite simple. Um, but it's also kind of, I don't know if it's a majority belief or so that uh, transmons is probably too simple actually to come up with a scalable system because of this annoyance of the unharmonicity. So uh, we 
many groups are currently investigating what else can we do, adding more junctions, having some higher anonymity in the system, but still being insensitive to noise. The point is then you always pick up some flux noise or in, in, in mo most of the cases you pick up flux noise and then you have some other uh, uh, noise channels that will degrade the properties of the system or makes it harder to control it. But yes, that's, that's on the way. I see. Okay. Thank you. So uh, normally, if uh, people do not ask questions, I at this stage uh, would advertise the next speaker, but the next speaker is uh, not available yet. Uh, but you are all invited to uh, send speakers to Mustafa and me. We are organizing the quantum seminar also in the next semester. Uh, I uh, mostly by Dima actually. I already have a couple of suggestions, but everybody is welcome to send uh, things to me. Um, yeah, if there are no other questions, I think we can uh, close the seminar and thank uh, Stefan Philipp again for a very interesting talk. Uh, yeah, I learned a lot and uh, I hope we see each other in person at some stage, um, maybe in Mainz or in Munich. Thanks a lot. Yes, I hope so as well. And yeah, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Oh, all right. Have a great semester break, everybody. See you in the next year. <laughs> thanks. Half year. Bye. Bye.